form for biology biological molecules learning objectives students should be able to identify the chemical elements present in carbohydrates proteins and lipids they should be able to describe the structure of carbohydrates proteins and lipids as large molecules made up from smaller basic units they should be able to investigate the food samples for the presence of glucose starch proteins and fats and finally they should be able to identify the sources and describe the functions of carbohydrates proteins lipids and vitamins minerals dietary fibers as components of a balanced diet biological molecules are you wondering what makes you come to life there are few important chemicals made out of carbon hydrogen oxygen mainly that are known as organic molecules some people call them as macromolecules there are four different types of biological molecules namely carbohydrates lipids proteins and nucleic acid and during this lesson we'll be discussing only about the first three biological molecules except nucleic acids in these molecules carbon atoms are bonded to the other carbon atoms as well as other elements like hydrogen these organic molecules can be large and show a wide variety of chain and ring structures with many carbon atoms bonded together so one small question why do living organisms need these organic molecules well these will provide energy to drive life processes and at the same time they will provide raw materials for the growth and repair of tissues if we sum up all the chemical reactions taking place in living organisms we can call it as metabolism these biological molecules are very useful for organisms to continue their metabolic reactions balanced diet so why do we actually need food well it's to supply us with fuel for energy and it's to provide materials for growth and repair of tissues and also to help fight diseases and keep our body healthy the food that we take in can be divided into two different nutrients carbohydrates lipids proteins vitamins minerals fiber and water but keep in mind that we don't need these seven nutrients in equal amounts that wouldn't obviously be a healthy diet so this is where the concept of balanced diet comes into play a balanced diet includes the seven nutrients in appropriate proportions or correct amounts so in this pie chart here is a bit of a representation of a balanced diet you have nearly 30% of carbohydrates and 30% of fruits and vegetables proteins and dairy in equal amounts but less than carbohydrates and also a small amount of fats and sugary foods nowadays lot of people end up having too much dairy food or fats proteins and they don't get enough fresh fruits and vegetables so this can lead them to suffer from severe health consequences eventually but there's another thing that we should consider not everybody's diet is the same different people have different energy requirements according to their gender according to their job age the amount of physical activity they involve in a 2 year old will need about 5000 kJ of energy per day whereas a 15 year old boy needs about 12000 kJ per energy per day carbohydrates 
they are the body's main source of energy they contain the elements carbon hydrogen oxygen the first type is simple sugars simple sugars contain monosaccharides which are the simplest form of carbohydrates the other type is complex sugars disaccharides and polysaccharides fall under this category in order to study about carbohydrates we need to know what are called monomers and polymers monomers are the small building blocks that make up these huge macromolecules think of the letters of an alphabet monomers are like the letters of the alphabet that strings together to make the words or even sentences here is a clear illustration showing how monomers form themselves together to structure a polymer which is a large molecule made up of a long chain of repeating subunits of monomers so we mentioned earlier that carbohydrates can be divided into two main groups the first one is simple sugars the second type is complex carbohydrates simple sugars are soluble in water they taste sweet might be made out of one unit like glucose fructose and galactose sucrose molecules are made up of two monosaccharides joined together so it's called as a disaccharide sucrose is made out of glucose and fructose lactose is also a disaccharide made up of glucose joined together with galactose which is another monosaccharide polymers of sugar such as starch glycogen and cellulose are called polysaccharides glucose glucose is the simplest form of carbohydrate which is made in photosynthesis process and is used in the respiration process as a substrate it has six carbon atoms and the atom form a ring structure the glucose molecule is nicely illustrated in this picture so glucose is found in uh, many sweet tasting foods such as fruits and vegetables fructose or fruit sugar is another monosaccharide like glucose it's naturally found in fruits honey and many root vegetables fructose is sourced from sugar cane sugar beets and corn fructose has the sweetest taste of all whereas galactose here is another monomer or a simple sugar which is composed of the same elements as glucose but has a different arrangement of atoms in human body most of the ingested galactose is converted to glucose galactose can be bind to glucose to make lactose to lipids to make glycolipids or to proteins to make glycoproteins sucrose when taking a look at this illustration we can see that sucrose is the main sugar that transported through the plant stems that is why we can extract it from sugar cane so we'll see how a sucrose molecule has formed by a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule by the way these junctions in the ring structure represent carbon atoms often in these kind of illustrations people don't actually bother to draw the carbon atoms individually and you'll see that each of the carbon atom has four bonds to it so we got a glucose molecule here 
and a fructose molecule here and after the reaction a water molecule has been taken off from the two molecules and the previous molecules are joined together by an oxygen bridge. Now as a result a disaccharide has been formed using two monosaccharides. This looks like quite complicated and you don't need to memorize these structures at IGCSE level so I bet that you can remember these structures in a easier way by using geometric shapes so here a red hexagon represents a glucose molecule and a yellow pentagon represents a fructose molecule there is a new bond between these two molecules after the reaction and uh, a water molecule is uh, resulted in this reaction. So we call these type of reactions as condensation reactions as it's giving out water. Anyway this is a reversible reaction. Starch. Starch is the plant storage carbohydrate. You can see how huge these molecules are. The glucose molecules are joined together in starch. Glucose is the monomer unit of starch. Starch is large and insoluble or doesn't dissolve and gets lost from the cells. And also it's compact so lots of glucose can be stored in less space. Starch is not very reactive like glucose. We can eat starch as well in, from our diet. When we eat it, we can digest it into a disaccharide called maltose. Maltose is a combination of two glucose molecules. Then we chop the maltose into two glucose during digestion. So you will get a glucose molecule. Cellulose. Cellulose is another carbohydrate. It's a polymer of glucose. It is the material that makes up plant cell walls. If it can be used to make plant cell walls, it should be pretty stable and pretty strong. Cellulose has a structure that is really difficult to digest. Humans are not able to digest cellulose because our gut doesn't make the enzyme needed to break down the molecule cellulose and it's also uh, uh, the cellulose uh, is ca cannot be taken as an energy source as well. If we take cellulose or plant based materials in our diet it supplies dietary fibers which gives the muscles of the gut something to push against as the food moves through the intestine. This keeps the gut contents moving and avoid constipation and consequences like bowel cancers. Glycogen. Glycogen is really similar to starch but contains anim in animal cells. It's just glucose again and we got our chain of glucose running along here. And uh, the difference is the branches which comes out of the uh, so glycogen is branched it's the animal storage carbohydrate you can see lots of these ends in each branch in this picture the ends are colored in orange that's really useful for animals because when we break down glycogen in order to release the glucose in it to be used in respiration, we break it down from these ends. If you only get one end as you would do in starch, 
you can break it down very easily and the process will take some time but as you can see in this illustration uh, there are so many ends uh, for this molecule glycogen so it's very useful to break down gl uh, glycogen very quickly and uh, inside animals there will be a, a high metabolic rate so the structure plays an important role in the function of the molecule lipids lipids contain the same three elements as carbohydrates which are carbon hydrogen and oxygen but in different proportions lipids has much less oxygen than in carbohydrates fats and oils are lipids lipids are made up of two types of molecules which are glycerol and fatty acids there are two types of fatty acids which are known as saturated and unsaturated fatty acids uh, saturated fatty acids are the ones that animals make so butter lard uh, can give you saturated fatty acids these are solids in room temperature and they are called fats whereas those which are found in plants are liquid at room temperature and are known as unsaturated fatty acids and they are also uh, called as uh, oils lipids store much more energy per gram than carbohydrates or proteins lipids make up about 10% of your body mass they form an essential part of the structure of all cells and fat is deposited in certain parts of the body as a long term storage uh, of energy for example under the skin and around delicate organs as liver and kidneys the adipose tissue layer or the fat layer around these delicate organs help to protect these organs from mechanical damage lipids play an important part of the cell membrane of a typical animal cell as well so according to the illustration lipids are made up of a molecule of glycerol joined to three fatty acids the structure has large hydrocarbon chains here we have hydrogen atoms in the outside and carbon atoms in the inside because of this structure it makes them non polar since they are non polar they don't uh, like to grab on to water that's why if you put fat in water it doesn't mix proteins proteins are made up of amino acids like starch proteins are also polymers but whereas starch is made from a single molecular building block proteins are made from 20 different subunits of amino acids all amino acids have four chemical elements hydrogen carbon oxygen along with nitrogen some amino acids contain sulfur let's break down the parts of an amino acid we have a carbon atom in the middle we have a hydrogen on one side we have a carboxylic group on one side and there is a amino group and there is a r or a variable group which changes we have 20 different amino acids that we use to make our proteins and each one of these 20 has a different r group so between two amino acids there will be a condensation reaction as you can see in the picture below two amino acids get combined by a peptide bond and a water molecule is released so proteins are used for growth repair and making enzymes hemoglobin is a protein which is used in oxygen transportation and remember the shape of a protein is very important to the way they function 
the order of the amino acids determines the shape of the protein. That is why it's important that we see how many possible combinations or orders of amino acids there really are. There are infinite numbers of shapes of proteins and uh, some proteins are structural proteins such as collagen and keratin whereas some proteins have more specific functions as enzymes. So let's talk about vitamins. We've been told throughout our lives to eat a certain food because they contain vitamins. And the obvious question is, what are these vitamins? There are lots of things in our body that the body needs and capable of producing, but there are certain things that our body cannot produce itself. So vitamins are such organic molecules that our body can't produce. Vitamins are only needed in small quantities to maintain a healthy body. A lack of vitamin in the diet leads to deficiency symptom. Some vitamins are fat soluble like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K. But some are water soluble like vitamin C. Fat soluble vitamins are easier to overdose on because they are soluble in fat. They can be inside your system a lot longer while water soluble vitamins are easier to flush out from your system. So we will discuss about vitamin C. Vitamin C is needed to make fibers of a material called connective tissue. Connective tissues acts as a glue bonding cells together in a tissue. It also helps to heal the wounds. Fresh fruits and vegetables are a great source of vitamin C. Specifically, citrus fruits. Vitamin C deficiency leads to a disease called scurvy. Scurvy is not too common anymore, but several hundred years ago, sailors would often get scurvy because they had very limited diets and they did not get fresh fruits and vegetables all the time. Because of their vitamin C deficiency, their collagen connective tissues would break down. Vitamin D. Talking about vitamin D, it's needed for growing bones to take up calcium salts. A deficiency of vitamin D can result in rickets. Fish liver oils, sardines are a good source of vitamin D. And also, the human skin can make vitamin D when it's exposed to sunlight. Vitamin A. Vitamin A is needed to make a light sensitive chemical in the retina of the eye. A lack of this vitamin causes night blindness where a person finds it difficult to see the dim light. Carrots, butter, fish, liver are a good source of vitamin A. Mineral ions. There are certain things that your body needs but it can't produce itself and are not organic molecules. So these are known as mineral ions. Like vitamins, mineral ions are only needed in small amounts to maintain a healthy body. Calcium ions. So they are needed to maintain a healthy bone system and teeth for normal blood clotting process and also to control muscle contractions. Cheese, eggs, milk, uh, fresh green leaves are a good source of calcium. The symptoms of calcium deficiency include weak bones and teeth, poor clotting of the blood.
Iron is also another important mineral that is needed to produce hemoglobin which is found in red blood cells. Liver, red meat, beans and nuts, dried fruits are a good source of iron. Likewise, there are some other minerals like phosphorus, sodium, chlorine, magnesium which helps the smooth functioning of our body. Mineral deficiency diseases. If a person doesn't get enough of a mineral from their diet, they will show the symptoms of a mineral deficiency disease. These illustrations are few examples for such diseases. A lack of iron in one's daily food intake will cause anemia and low levels of immunity. A lack of sodium in one's diet will cause muscle cramps and mental apathy and loss of appetite. The absence of zinc in appropriate levels is associated with a number of conditions as appetite disorders, impaired cognitive and motor functions. Goiter is a visible sign of severe iodine deficiency. Phosphorus deficiency will lead to bad teeth and bones. Calcium deficiency will cause osteoporosis. Last but not the least, we are going to discuss about water and dietary fibers. These are two also important components in a balanced diet. About two-thirds of the human body is water and it is found in the cytoplasm of the cells and uh, body fluids like blood. We get water by food and beverages and also from metabolic processes such as aerobic respiration. Dietary fibers consist of materials in food that can't be digested, in particular cellulose in plants. Whole grain cereals are a good source of dietary fiber. They are important because it provides bulk which helps the walls of the intestine move food and feces along the gut. Lack of dietary fibers can lead to constipation. Now we are moving on to a new section of this lesson. We are going to learn how to carry out chemical tests for carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Before doing any of these practicals, we should take the food sample and grind with distilled water using a mortar and pestle. We want to make a food paste. We then transfer the paste to a beaker and add more distilled water. We stir this so the chemicals in the food dissolve in the water. Next, we filter the solution to remove suspended food particles. At this stage, we can now test our solution for the chemicals present. We are going to start by testing for carbohydrates. This includes starch and also sugars such as glucose. For the test for starch, we have to place 2 cubic centimeters of food solution into a test tube. And then we will add few drops of iodine solution which is in orange color. If starch is present, the iodine solution will turn its color into blue-black. However, if there is no starch, then the iodine color will stay. Test for glucose. Testing for a sugar such as glucose is a bit more tricky. Again, we start with a 2 cubic centimeters of our food solution. We then add 10 drops of Benedict's solution, which is in blue color. 
we place the test tube in a water beaker and we boil it for 5 minutes then we have to observe the color change of the solution if sugar is present the benedict solution will change its color the color of the benedict solution will give a rough idea of the amount of sugars present in the solution if you get a green color solution it tells us that there is a small amount of glucose in the food solution a yellow color solution tells us that there is more sugar present than before and if you get a brick red color precipitate it tells us that there is a lot of sugar present in the food solution so these are the results tube 2 has a brick red precipitate so it contains glucose it shows positive results for the benedict's test but keep in mind that the benedict's test will not work for sugars which are non reducing such as sucrose test for protein we take 2 cubic centimeters of our food solution into a test tube and we add 2 cubic centimeters of biuret solution which is a blue color solution if the solution contains protein then the biuret solution will change its color from blue to a purple or a pink color test for lipid in this test just like before we grind our food with distilled water using a mortar and pestle however unlike the other tests we do not filter the solution when testing for lipids we transfer 2 cubic centimeters of our food solution to a test tube and we add ethanol to the tube and give it a quick shake so the fats will dissolve in the ethanol then you have to add an equal volume of cold water to it and shake it again then the fat will be visible in the solution and forms kind of a cloudy white emulsion if you get a cloudy white emulsion for the food sample that you have tested that means the food sample contains lipids so these are some questions for you to answer so as we have come to an end of this lesson we'll take a small summary of the lesson we learn the chemical elements structure and functions of carbohydrates proteins and lipids we identify the sources of biological molecules we investigate food samples for the presence of glucose starch proteins and fats and we discussed about mineral and vitamin deficiency diseases and learned the importance of a balanced diet so here are some references thank you very much